Amen. And I wish to hand over to our pastor. He would by now have been very well uh, schooled and advised on how the program runs. And without waste of time, Pastor Goethe, I would like you to come on and uh, take over so that the whole platform will be yours now. God bless you and uh, take care. Amen. Thank you so much. And uh, many thanks to the organizers of this program for having me join you in this uh, time of worship. Uh, it is a great privilege and I do not take it lightly. Uh, thank you and thank you and thank you. Um, I am so, so glad that uh, this week, the Lord has impressed upon my heart a message uh, which is uh, concerning the gospel of the grace of God. Our series uh, is uh, uh, titled Grace Galore, Grace Galore. Uh, this is what we are going to be sharing on uh, all through this week by the grace of God. And our study will be focused on Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. Now, this passage, particularly uh, verse 8 of Ephesians chapter 2, is a golden text. It's a golden text of God's grace. As a matter of fact, uh, the new, uh, next to the, 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 the text, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and John chapter 3, verse 16, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, is the most quoted verse in the Bible, the most quoted verse in the Bible. Furthermore, brothers and sisters, um, it is well known as Paul's doctrine of salvation by grace in miniature. Paul's doctrine of salvation by grace in miniature, meaning that he presents to us in a very brief and or succinct manner, uh, the gospel of the grace of God, which he, he espouses in Romans and Galatians. In fact, along with Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 26, this passage is Paul's most complete statement on the doctrine of salvation by grace. You look at Paul's teaching, on righteousness by faith in Galatians, uh, in Romans, and also in Ephesians, particularly in chapter two, you will notice the themes of theology and ethics. And uh, it is presented in a miniature way or in a succinct way in our text, Ephesians chapter two, uh, particularly verses one to 10, where in verses one to nine, Paul is actually talking theology and particularly in verse 10, it begins to make some applications or to talk about the ethics, the application of uh, the theological principles. Now, this text seems to also encapsulate or, you know, present in another miniature way, the five solas of the Protestant Reformation, uh, the scripture being you know, the, the only basis of our faith and practice, uh, salvation being by, you know, uh, grace and through faith and in Christ alone, you find these five principles of the Protestant Refo uh, Reformation captured right there in this passage in Ephesians chapter two, verses eight to 10. In fact, my dear friends, Ephesians chapter two, verses eight to 10, presents to us some remarkable truths about the grace of God by which we are saved. When you study this passage, you will learn that we are saved by grace. We are saved through faith. We are saved as a gift. We are saved not of works. We are saved for God and we are saved onto good works. Those are the key themes that actually come out of this text for us concerning the grace of God. So in our study this week, we will look at the following topics. 
First, we'll look at the prelude of saving grace or the principle of saving grace. Then we'll look at the process of saving faith, the provision of God's saving gift. And then we'll look at the pollution of man's self-saving works, the portrait of the savior. And then we'll look at the practice of the saved. Those are going to be the topics that we will consider in our study. Today, our focus is on the prelude of saving grace, the prelude of saving grace. And our text today will be Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Now, we are looking at the entire pericope, the entire unit of text from which our key text for the week is gleaned, which is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. So we'll look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, which form the unit, the textual unit or pericope from which our text is gleaned. So today we're going to read from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Kindly, if you will, turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. And if you, as you do that, permit me, if you will, to affirm what I believe about the Bible. In a time when we find the proliferation of different views about the Bible, it, it, it behooves one, it seems to be incumbent upon one to give a disclaimer or at least an affirmation of what he or she believes about the Bible. So I wish to let you know, friends, that I affirm the supremacy of the Bible. I believe that the Bible is not just the, you know, uh, the ultimate authority, it is the sole authority. The Bible is not just the supreme authority, it is the sole authority on matters of faith and doctrine. I also, affirm the sufficiency of the Bible. I believe that the Bible is sufficient to make us wise unto salvation. And finally, I affirm the Bible's summation or its totality. I believe that all scripture comprising the Old and the New Testaments only and 66 books only is God's inspired word. So with that affirmation of what we believe about the Bible, I would now ask you to join me as a read from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. The Bible says here, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the cause of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. And then verse number three says, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, okay, even uh, when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse 7 says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Inspired by this passage, our message today is titled, Prelude of Saving Grace. Prelude of 
saving grace. Let us pray. Father, speak to our hearts today as you know how to. And as it has pleased you, God, to use a frail, filthy, and feeble vessel as myself, I do not ask for mighty words of human wisdom to move the audience. All I ask now, O oh Lord, is that my humanity will diminish and that divinity will dominate as you speak to us pointedly, powerfully, and personally in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen and amen. So the message today is titled, Prelude of Saving Grace. Prelude of Saving Grace. As I mentioned earlier, this is the, this passage, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, is the pericope or the textual unit from which our, you know, a series text, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10, is gleaned. And this particular passage presents to us two important truths which will form the basis for or the outline for our study today. The two important points are, number one, the God of grace, the God of grace. Number two, the grace of God. So emanating from this text, coming out of this text, are the two principal you know, points, the God of grace and the grace of God. And so we go into the text now and look at these two points and see how they come out of the text and how they apply to us. First, let's look at the God of grace, the God of grace. And this is uh, really covering verses one to seven of Ephesians chapter, to two. And here Paul, who was a master in conveying God's great truth, presents to us in verses one to three of Ephesians chapter two, the pathetic plight of unbelievers, the pathetic plight of unbelievers. And then as he is presenting the condition of unbelievers, he then reaches verse four, where there is a turn. He introduces the glorious alternative available to this pathetic lot, you know, of, of, of unbelievers. And the key words he uses to uh, illustrate that are, but God, but God. And then in uh, verses, if you look at uh, verses, uh, um, uh, the next couple of verses, four, Four to seven, he describes the redemptive actions of God, that is the God of grace, towards the race of disgrace. So let's go into this text and see in verses one to seven how the God of grace is revealed and what is said about his grace. The first thing the text presents to us is the objects of his grace, the objects of the grace of God in verses one to three. Who are the objects of the grace of God? Verses one to three, uh, notice what the Bible says here. In verse one, the Bible says, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Who were dead in trespasses and sins. In which you once walked according to the cause of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So we see here the objects of the grace of God. Look at the next couple of verses here. In verse three, the text says, among whom also we all, all, were once, con we all con once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. So what we find in this text, my friends, are number one, those who were the objects of the grace of God are described in the following terms. Number one, they were dead in trespasses and sins. Number two, they walked according to the cause of this world. In other words, according to the world's system. And then number three, they lived according to the will of Satan. These were people who were clearly in the world. These were people who were clearly 
destined to die. So the ones who became the objects of the grace of God were people who were dead. That's number one. Were people who walked according to the things of this world. Were people who lived according to the will of Satan. Remember that Paul is writing to a church in Ephesus and these are Gentiles. And he is saying also we. So he is actually speaking to an audience that is made of people who were Gentiles. But the fact that he uses the inclusive we suggests that even Paul himself had a past. So the objects of the grace of God are those who were dead, are those who walked according to the course of this word, are those who lived according to the ways of the devil. So we find the objects of the grace of God. The second thing we see in this particular passage is in verse 4, the origin of his grace, the origin of the grace of God. It says, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. So the origin the basis, the, the source of the grace of God is the love of God. In other words, the grace of God comes to us from the very heart of divine love. God is merciful. God is love. God is gracious because God is love. God shows us his grace because he is love. God shows us his mercy because he is love. So the origin of the grace of God is the love of God. God so loved the world that he gave. He gave us grace. He gave us his only begotten son. The text also then goes on to show us the operation of his grace. The object of his grace the origin of his grace, now the operation of his grace. What was the action that God took graciously towards us? Ephesians chapter two, verses five to six, the Bible says, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And then it says in verse number seven, it says that in the ages to come, he must show the exceeding riches of his grace. So the operation of his grace, what do we see happening here? What does his grace accomplish for us? Brothers and sisters, the Bible says his grace made us alive, meaning we who we were, we were dead are now made alive. We are made alive. Number two, it raised us up. Number three, it made us sit. Take note of the action there. First, from death to life. Second, from lying in sin to being raised up together. And then third, from walking in sin, we now sit together with Christ in heavenly places. I need you to take note also of the word together. We are made alive together with Christ. We are raised up together and we are made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Brothers, we are raised with Christ in his resurrection. We are alive with Christ in his resurrection. This is what you call the resurrection life of Jesus. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the, from the grave is at work in us, resuscitating us, rejuvenating us, bringing life to the deadness in our being. Amazing indeed that we are, by the operation of God's grace, made alive life, raised up and made to sit together with Christ in heavenly places. That is our position. Uh, friends, we also see number four, we see the objective of his grace. Why did God do all of this? Why did he do all of this? He did all of these things because he wanted to show the exceeding riches of his grace. 
In verse 7, the text says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So the objective of God's grace is to show the exceeding riches, the reason for saving us, the reason for calling us to himself, the reason for, you know, uh, um, what God has accomplished through the operation of his grace, for making us to be alive together with Christ, for raising us up together with Christ, for making us to sit together with Christ. The reason for all of these things is that he will show the exceeding riches of his grace. So we see the God of grace. And there are four things we have seen. The object of grace, those who are dead in sin, the objective of his grace, the, 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 the origin of his grace, the love of God. We also saw the operation of his grace. It made us alive. It raised us up. It made us to sit with him in heavenly places. And we saw the objective of his grace to show the exceeding riches of his grace. He saved us in order to demonstrate the exceeding riches, the incalculable, immeasurable riches of his love and his grace toward us. And let's look at the, the next and final part of our study, the grace of God. We have seen the God of grace, now the grace of God. In verses 8 to 10, Paul now describes the grace of God by which a disgraced race is saved. The grace of God by which a disgraced race is saved. Oh, friend, God's purpose for salvation is given to us, and God's purpose for the saved is also given to us. So here is the first point, the objective of salvation. Take note of the word for. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God not of works, least anyone should boast. Listen, friend, for by grace you have been saved. That word signals purpose. The objective of salvation. Why did God save us by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone? What was the purpose of a salvation that is exclusively of God. What is the purpose? The answer is simple. So that no one will boast. So that there will be no boasting among the Jewish people and no boasting among the Gentiles. No one will boast. So we see the objective of salvation by grace alone in Christ. The second thing the text actually gives to us uh, is the objective of the saved. So first, the objective of salvation. Why are we saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone? The answer is simple. So that no one will boast. No one will share the glory of God. The next point is this. The objective of the saved. If you look at verse 10, it says for. You see the word for again occurs. Signaling purpose again, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The reason for us being saved is given to us in this text. Why did God save us by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, so that no one would boast? Why did God save us? What is the reason for the saved, for us? What's God's purpose for our lives? The answer is simple. For good works. For good works. We have been created in Christ Jesus for good works. Friends, in today's study, we have seen from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, the God of grace the God of grace. And we look at the objects of his grace. Unregenerate man, sinners, destined to die. We look at the, you know, the origin of his grace, the love of God, the heart of divine love. 
the operation of his grace. He made us alive. He raised us up. He made us sit with Christ in heavenly places. And the objective of his grace, to show the exceeding riches of his saving grace. We also look at the grace of God, the grace of God. And we look at the objective of our salvation by grace alone, in Christ alone, through faith alone, so that no one will boast, so that no one will boast. And then the objective of the saved, God's purpose for the saved is that they will do good works, good works, good works. Friends, as we close this message, I wish to remind you of the amazing story behind the amazing hymn, Amazing Grace, written almost two and a half decades ago in 1772. The words for amazing grace were born from the heart, the mind, and experiences of an English man called John Newton. He lived through a rather unfortunate and troubled childhood. His mother passed very early in his life when he was just six years old. And friends, I need you to understand that he spent years fighting against authority, going so far as to try to desert the Royal Navy in his 20s. Later, he, abandoned, he was abandoned you know, by the crew in West Africa. He was forced to be a servant to slave trader. And on the return voyage to England, a severe storm hit and almost sunk the ship, prompting Newton to begin his spiritual conversation with God and eventually his transformation before God. And friends, upon his return, Newton, this man became a slave ship master, a profession in which he served for several years bringing slaves from Africa, from Guinea, and other places to England and on multiple trips. He was ordained as an Anglican priest later on after he was converted. But I need you to understand that this man, on one of his trips as he was coming back, he began to have, you know, uh, yeah, the, the, the slaves probably warming, you know, uh, or something. And he began to add words to that. He was miraculously saved from death. He was preserved by God. And Newton wrote the amazing song, Amazing Grace. Think about his life. He was a sinner like me. Think about his life. He was a wicked man. Think about his life. He was a slave trader. Think about his life. But out of this life of disgraceful living, Newton experienced the grace of God. Hence, he wrote the song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Newton said, the prodigal had never been so exemplified as by myself. Newton also said, I see no reason why the Lord signaled me out for mercy unless it was to share by one astonishing instance that with him, nothing is impossible. And that is exactly my point. I don't know where you come from. What is the condition of your life? But this week, the Holy Spirit is poised to open our eyes to the grace of God. There is grace for you. There is room for you at the cross because of the God of grace and the grace of God. Let us pray. And as we pray, I want you to ponder these words of Ellen White. She says, we owe everything to grace, free grace, sovereign grace, Grace in the covenant ordained our adoption. Grace in the Savior effected our redemption, our regeneration, and our adoption to airship with Christ. Father, we thank you for being the God of grace. Father, we thank you for the grace of God that saved sinners like us. And if there is anyone on this platform 
following on the internet, whether it is through the Zoom platform or Facebook or YouTube or any other platform, including Telegram and WhatsApp, who does not know the grace of God? Father, let him come to know the God of grace and experience the grace of God. Thank you, Father. Be magnified in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.